So um, COP, uh, the Conference of Parties of the UN um, Framework Convention on Climate Change is, uh, has been going on for 10 days and it's about to wrap up. Um, Anderson has been there. And so the first thing we're gonna do in, uh, is to get some immediate reactions on COP, what has happened there because COP really sets the scene for Asia's challenge on, uh, on climate change, uh, which is also a proxy for environmentalism and, and so on. So first question towards Anderson, give us your feedback. What did you learn? What are you happy about? What are you sad about? And what, uh, what does it mean for your company? Uh, Pamela, again, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with all distinguished guests here today. Uh, just came back from uh, Glasgow actually a few days ago. I'm back in Indonesia, but three takeaways. First, I think the urgency of the issue is getting higher and higher. Uh, really, compared to COP21 in Paris, which was about six years ago, which was a blink of an eye, COP21 felt like it was a discussion amongst the elite with the elite. Uh, COP26 this time around really is a conference of parties, not only for nations, but also a lot of, it, a lot of its citizens. Um, I think the impetus to change uh, uh, and the discussion on climate change has really turned mainstream. And that's one of the biggest takeaways. The second takeaway actually is quite interesting. There was a quote given by one of the a Ministry of Foreign Affairs from uh, one of the countries. Um, everyone knows we're entering one of the worst storms in the ocean, but everyone's on a different boat and every nation's on a different boat. Uh, and that is, that is very interesting because each of its boat has its own priorities, has its own captain and has different passengers. So how do you navigate this storm uh, that we all know is gonna be uh, revolutionary and it's very changing in terms of environment, but everyone's on a different boat. So that's the biggest challenge for COP26 as we can already see with some of the conversations that's starting. Uh, last but not least, actually is from the private sector side. The private sector involvement and the philanthropic foundations, uh, both from Asia and, uh, and, and Western uh, developed countries are getting much more active. So I think there is a desire for private sector and some of the philanthropy and foundations to actually take a leadership in some of the portions uh, of the discussion on climate change. That is from uh, businesses becoming much more nature positive, businesses aligning themselves with reduction of emissions, having a plan towards net zero. Um, and that's, I think, very important. I think everyone realizes that zero emissions uh, is still an aim and very aspirational. Aim. But net zero is no, no longer an aspirational aim. There are ways that we can, of course, reduce emissions first. But once the emissions are reduced to a certain economic optimization, then hopefully uh, we have the responsibility and the obligation also to uh, offset uh, in certain ways possible. So that's the three takeaways from, uh, from Glasgow and I'm happy to hear also all the other distinguished panels and their perspective and opinion. Thank you, Anderson. Uh, it sets a great scene for uh, the conversation. I'd like to ask um, Ma Jun, you have been tracking the private sector's approach on the environment for a number of years. What are the changes that you are seeing in terms of how the private sector takes on sustainability and how do you think COP26 is going to change that? Unmute yourself. Thank you. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think COP26 unfortunately come, uh, came at a, at a very difficult moment, you know, when, when the global pandemic is still going on and um, uh, uh, with these uh, new uh, challenges on a looming uh, global energy crisis, uh, you know, with China suffering from the worst uh, power shortage in 10 years of time. And um, we have seen, uh, not just in China, but in America, in Europe, UK, you know, some of the fossil fuel capacity being released and uh, uh, all this going to have a profound and negative impact on the global uh, climate agenda. Um, on the other hand, you know, uh, I think uh, we, uh, we can see that um, uh, governments are making efforts in, uh, in different regions. China has published its one plus N national guidelines on carbon pick and neutrality uh, with, uh, with key principles. Uh, uh, I think principle number one is uh, to manage the whole process, like playing a grand chess game, 
making sure that the actions uh, will be coordinated between regions and sectors uh, so that we can avoid another, uh, you know, one step forward and half step back you know, by uh, releasing the coal capacity. And princi principle number two is to establish new mechanism before we scrap the old ones. Uh, uh, you know, the energy supply is a clear example. You know, we need to work on the demand side to check the energy and intensive uh, uh, and, and pollution intensive industries uh, from further expanding. And on the supply side, the intermittent nature of renewables, you know, that's the common challenge the whole world is facing. And um, uh, at this moment, uh, you know, my takeaway uh, is that, uh, uh, you know, with all this headwind, with uh, plus the geopolitical tension, uh, the state actors may not be able to come up with uh, an ambition, you know, big enough to uh, to ensure uh, 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius. So we need more non. Act, state actors, uh, uh, you know, we need their actions. Uh, uh, the market, the, the companies have to do more. So, uh, so we're tracking their performance. We created the index, carbon uh, the climate action, co corporate climate action index, and use that just has used that to assess more than 660 uh, global and local brands in their uh, climate action. And what we found is that. Uh, uh, beside, uh, uh, you know, except a few uh, real front runners, uh, most of them have yet to be able to really consolidate their commitment, especially on the supply chain side. But all these brands, you know, if they don't tackle the supply chain carbon footprint, especially in China as the factory of the world, then they could fail their commitment. So, so on that, a lot more needs to be done. Yeah, thank you, um, thank you, Doctor uh, Doctor Ma. I, I I think you raise you raise a really good point, which is that everyone's eyes are on China's ability to meet um, its commitments, and uh, and given the globalized nature of its economy, how many global actors are present in the economy, what they do is really essential. Um, I I would like to uh, turn to uh, Doctor uh, Chen uh, Jiwu to talk about how you know, everyone wants China to do um, more um, and to do uh, things in a really proactive way, which, which it is. I mean, it is actually one of the few countries which is going to overshoot, overperform its, um, its NDC, you know, according to current actions. And this is from a report by FTSE Russell. Um, how, does, how does the world come together in and make uh, climate change action, a bridge builder between China and the rest of the world, especially in such time of, you know, geopolitical tension, there, there, there is possibly no other issue where our interests are so closely aligned, China's and the rest of the world. So, um, Dr. Chen, what would you like to see where we use climate in order to bring China and, uh, and, and, and the rest of the world closer together? How do we collaborate? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Pam. I, I think the, oh, yeah, so I think uh, for China, probably um, uh, in order to avoid overshooting tendencies, uh, as we have seen, not just in the pandemic, but also in the uh, net zero uh, target uh, goal uh, achievement and so on, uh, maybe China should let the market play a bigger role. Uh, I know this sounds uh, uh, very uh, counterintuitive to many people, uh, but uh, if we look at, uh, as uh, Dr. Ma just mentioned, uh, if we look at the, um, the power shortage crisis that is going on in China, uh, many people don't understand why uh, across the country, um, you know, factories have to, uh, uh, you know, only operate only for five or even four days uh, out of uh, each week, so seven days. Um, you know, why can't they uh, have more uh, electricity? Well, uh, thanks to the NDC and other uh, government uh, administrative efforts, uh, they really wanted to um, take the, um, uh, you know, climate goals very seriously, which, which is good. Uh, but then they, they took it seriously in the usual way. That is, 
uh, by single purposely or single in a single goal way, just looking at uh, emission reduction goals and ignore uh, uh, the consequences of very drastic, uh, immediate uh, and even brutal uh, administrative uh, efforts uh, can actually lead to, uh, you know, in terms of what uh, uh, they, what those actions may imply for various many other things uh, of the society and economy. Uh, because for the last couple of years, especially last year, the uh, NDRC and other agencies uh, ordered uh, many factories, uh, especially coal mines, uh, to be shut down. Uh, so that uh, coal production was very uh, dramatically cut. So as a result of that, of course, not surprisingly, coal price uh, has been going higher and higher because at the same time, China was also uh, cutting uh, or stopping uh, uh, you know, the importing of uh, coal from Australia and so on. So the intention was really great. Uh, but as coal prices were going higher and higher, at the same time, the NDRC would not let uh, electricity price go higher because they thought, oh, God, well, you know, in order to make people uh, are still uh, able to afford uh, electricity usage in their homes and in their factories, electricity prices have to stay at a very low level, very affordable level. So then that created this uh, dilemma uh, for the uh, power generation factories, you know, because for each uh, extra watt of um, electricity they produce, uh, they lose uh, proportionally more money because coal prices are much higher now. And then electricity price still stays more or less as way it has been for many years. Uh, so uh, the, the, the fac uh, power factories then decided to just uh, do as little production as possible as a way to avoid losing more money. Uh, so I, I, I'm just using this as, uh, as an example to illustrate that uh, when, the, uh, when the officials uh, with good intentions try to use uh, their power uh, to uh, very abruptly and brutally uh, shut down the production of coal mines and many other uh, resource producing companies uh, with the intention of course, uh, uh, of achieving net zero as quickly as possible so that uh, China can be a role model for other countries without realizing that this kind of extreme quick uh, action uh, can actually uh, cause so many other disruptions. Uh, so as a result, everyone is scrambling, not only economic growth uh, is very much uh, in jeopardy, but also employment uh, and then you name it, you know, even real estate prices are, are uh, coming down. Uh, but of course, right uh, at this moment, in order to uh, uh, make the uh, power crisis or electricity prices uh, uh, go down or disappear quickly. Uh, now they are uh, finally raised in electricity, electricity prices. The reason that I, at the beginning I mentioned, uh, they should let the market play uh, more roles. For example, you know, if you really want to uh, achieve net zero, then let uh, the electricity prices go higher and higher because that's one way to cut uh, the demand uh, from households, from factories, and even for, from uh, cryptocurrency mining companies. Because if electricity prices are way higher, then uh, those uh, crypto mining companies will have to move, uh, shift all their computers somewhere else uh, outside China, maybe where electricity price uh, or prices are much lower. So, so I think that kind of uh, market mechanisms should be relied on uh, in addition to very brutal, uh, you know, dramatic, um, abrupt uh, administrative actions. Otherwise, uh, if they just, just would look at one purpose, one goal that is net zero, then they could actually create more crisis 
uh, one after another uh, in the larger society, economically, socially, and, and otherwise. Uh, so I, I guess they just have to balance uh, right, the different right. forces and mechanisms uh, in, in a proper way. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Chen. Uh, that's an excellent point. And we will return to market mechanisms um, in, in, uh, in a few minutes. I'd just like to turn to Eric. Uh, Minister, you have followed the international kind of uh, climate movement for many years. What are you seeing now? How can countries um, basically build bridges with each other? Uh, not, not only with China, although China is uh, obviously a clear global priority, but what are some of the best ways that we can drive uh, collaboration as we kind of collectively look at COP26 and, um, and, and, and find the next steps forward? Good afternoon to everyone in Asia. Let me start by building upon what Anderson Tonoto said about uh, Glasgow. There are some uh, important commitments from Glasgow. Uh, one is Prime Minister India, uh, Prime Minister Modi coming from India, making new Indian commitments. One of them is that India will source half of its energy from renewable. It will be basically be solar by 2030. That's a remarkable, uh, 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 ambitious goal for a, a rapidly developing country uh, like India. And there are commitments on deforestation and on methane. But largely, I believe that uh, climate negotiations and diplomacy is not as important as it was. Uh, 10 years back in Copenhagen, uh, it was all about the climate diplomacy because that was the only show in town. Everything in the world was rotating around the climate talks. That's not the case any longer. The initiative is now with business. It, it's with the political economy. So what's happening in the political economy, which is driving the change not uh, not uh, the climate talks. So while there may be some people who are disappointed after Glasgow, I don't think there's any reason to despair because we see so much movement in the political economy. That is like Europe, where the European taxonomy uh, will drive change uh, into the green in a very fast uh, pace. Uh, it will be much cheaper for companies to uh, to finance the green development and much, much more expensive to finance any coal or oil and gas or any uh, negatives. In the United States, um, uh, President Biden has put forward proposals in the range of uh, maybe $1,500 billion, which are green. These are part of his infrastructure and social uh, spending. And we expect them to go through in the next uh, couple of weeks and compare the numbers in Glasgow, the kind of the quarter is about 20 billion US dollars. Biden's proposals is in the range on the green is in the range of 1500 billion dollars, 1500 to 20. And it's much more important for even the poorest nations in the world, like say Madagascar and Malawi. It's much more important that Biden gets through his investment proposals, because if that happens, the price of solar and wind and electric mobility will rapidly fall, and these technologies will be much more uh, easily available uh, for developing nations. And then moving on to, uh, to China, which is basically now the front runner on everything green. Uh, President Xi has after COVID, I, I, I haven't even counted all the national parks, <clears throat> sorry, he has visited <laughs> to set out the need for the Chinese people to construct a beautiful China. And of course, President Xi's promise that China will stop all overseas uh, coal investments and all overseas coal construction is much, much more important for the world than any outcome of Glasgow. It's really the most important environment decision in the world in 2021. Added, President Xi, of course, has promised that China will plant an area the size of Belgium uh, with trees every year from now to 2030. An astonishing commitment, which put uh, China front and center in the necessary greening of the planet. And China, of course, is the biggest now on solar, on wind, on green hydrogen, electric mobility, electric trains, electric uh, cars, electric buses. Uh, indeed, 99% of all electric buses in the world are running on Chinese roads. So, zooming in finally on, on your question, uh, the West and China and developing nations should try to avoid finger pointing. Uh, we should realize with the very old Indian slogan, that the whole world is one family. We need to work together. Together we can resolve all the major crises of our time. 
whether it's the pandemic, whether it's a climate crisis, the need for development, need for trade, peace, whatever is critical to the people of the world, we can resolve together. If we move into something like decoupling or to speak of a new Cold War, everything will be much, much more difficult to manage. Uh, so particularly the relationship between China and the US is front and center uh, of the future of the world. But the rest of us should very, very clearly make the case that we do not want to choose. No other nation in the world want to choose. All of us want to be very friendly, have a great relationship to both China and the United States of America, work closely with them. And if we work together as one family, we will be able to solve all the major problems facing uh, humanity. But there are positive outcomes from Glasgow, but mainly diplomacy is not the main thing now. The main thing now is the political economy. Yeah, okay. Well, I uh, can't, can't disagree with that. Um, Eric, you have just uh, come back from India um, doing some own bridge building of yourself. Give us um, some reflection on uh, where India fits into kind of the, uh, the post-COP uh, environmental and climate challenge. First of all, there is an enormous pride and relief in India because COVID has come down enormously since the peak in April and May, where people were really, really scared and where many people died in India. Now they have put 1 billion jabs to the Indian people. Uh, before Christmas, um, basically every Indian adult will be vaccinated against COVID-19. And that's not a small uh, uh, development in such a difficult, diverse nation like, like India. And India will produce 400 million doses of vaccines for the world when they can start exporting uh, uh, in, into the new year. So let's celebrate this progress and it shows the ability of India to act. But on, on the environment, I see a huge progress. The old debate in India was very simple. Do we want to develop or do we want to take care of Mother Earth? And surprisingly, nearly all Indians wanted to develop. The new debate is how can we look for the win-wins? All those policies which are good for environment, good for people's health and reducing pollution, and good for jobs and the environment at the same time. And they're all available to move from coal into renewables, to move into electric mobility, uh, to uh, do green tourism, green agriculture, circular economy, all the policies for win-wins are there. And just to give you a few snapshots, uh, Prime Minister Modi just recently launched a green hydrogen mi mission for India uh, with two of the biggest giants of Indian industry, Mr. Ambani and Mr. Adani. Both of them together put 30 billion US dollars on the table for this green hydrogen mission for India, which is remarkable. And while India is lagging somewhat behind China, for instance, on electric mobility, they're moving, moving very fast in that direction. <clears throat> I had the privilege to, re to open the electric bus schemes in the big city of Mumbai, and it's one of the biggest mega cities in the world. And Mumbai will very soon be all electric in its, uh, when it comes to electric buses. And they aim to build 16 metro lines in Mumbai, which of course will drastically reduce uh, pollution. So while India is not China, uh, a lot is happening on the positive side when it comes to the environment in, the, in India. I mean, and uh, by saying that India has not doubled the tiger population, which is a remarkable positive development. And of course, it helps green tourism in a major way because watching tigers is one of the main uh, draws when it comes to bringing tourists to, to India. Hey, uh, thank you. I'd like to go back to um, the subject that was raised by Drew Wu, which is to let the market decide um, more about where uh, resources are allocated and to support sustainable development. So this is one of the big challenges. I mean, at least from the business perspective, we often have a tension. Do you want to be sustainable or do you want to have a high profit, high growth? So I'd like to ask the panel, how does Asia start to move its markets and its structure of incentives by business to support, sustain? like don't make us choose between sustainability and making money. Um, so, I, I, I guess I'm looking for uh, what are the ways, what are the, what are the measures that we should be looking for from um, Asia's societies in terms of reorienting the incentives so that business can act faster. I'd like to start with uh, Anderson. If you could tell us, I mean, you run a business. It's, it's like 
it's a um, it's a big conglomerate. You have many different parts of the supply chain. What are you looking to see when you when you think about your incentives? Um, you know, sustainability versus the market. I think there, there are two aspects that it, again is absolutely critical, and we're in the tipping point. First is the voluntary carbon market. Uh, I think that's very interesting because we have NDCs with the various nations, but a private sector can get involved in the voluntary carbon market, which is absolutely critical. I think that is, is, it's important to stress that a voluntary carbon market does not mean that you, you buy the right to pollute. Yeah? It, that's not correct because you still need to reduce your emissions. Uh, but there, it, gives a, it gives actually a mechanisms for nations and environments and places that actually uh, values standing force or avoided emissions. Uh, this is a perfect example like in Indonesia. Indonesia has about 170 million hectares of forest, uh, out of which about one third is actually developed into agriculture and various applications. But the two thirds of the standing forest, how can we derive value out of that more than someone going out there and burning the forest and turning it into a plantation? And, the, and one way we can do that is through a voluntary carbon mechanism. Uh, and I think that's very interesting. Uh, the discussion is ongoing, um, and I think it's going to take off very, very quickly. That's the first. The second one is on the market incentives. Uh, for example, we produce agricultural palm oil to produce edible oil that is 100% RSPO certified. But the premiums for RSPO to certification, five years ago, the cost of certifying the oil to make sure it was done right it was about $30 per ton but the premium was doing at $3, $4. But now in 2021, the premiums for a certified RSPO uh, uh, palm oil that is traceable all the way to exactly where it was produced is up to $25 to $30. So the market mechanisms for premiums uh, for edible oils are actually there. Second, there are actually standards now by emissions reduction. So for example, if you capture the methane of the effluent and reduce the emissions, we not, we don't, if you use bioenergy instead of coal, there's additional premiums. So in the, in the end, the market for, them, for, for the products that are sold is ready. But what I'm referring to is only in, in Europe. How can we have these incentives also for the largest markets in the world, whether it's India, whether it's China, whether it's Southeast Asia? So I think this percolation of premiums for products that are sustainable, and then the voluntary carbon market that allows actually the, the world to value standing for us or carbon that is locked in into, into various places. Okay, um, um, Mr. Ma, China um, has probably among the most extensive experience with um, uh, kind of ETS um, and, and, and a burgeoning carbon market. Would you like to comment on this? Sure, uh, I think, um, you know, we talked about transition would not be a kickback, and uh, we're talking about uh, uh, more than 1.3 to 400 trillion yuan of investment probably needed over the next uh, 40 years uh, uh, to China to, uh, to achieve carbon neutrality. Um, I think it's, uh, and of course, as Dr. Chan put it, you know, it's more efficient uh, for the market to, uh, to function. Uh, so the OnePlus and you know, national guidelines uh, uh, created in China also cited the importance to use market approach. Um, but to me, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's important to have the national emission trading system, uh, uh, but it's uh, it gotta be more than that because uh, that will take some real, some, some real time to, to mature so far. And um, if we want the market to function, we need to build the data information infrastructure. Uh, on that, China is making major preparations uh, through, and, uh, at IPE, you know, uh, the blue map database uh, that we have uh, launched uh, first 15 years ago now can track some 10 million companies uh, based on the vast government and corporate monitoring uh, program. Uh, it contains, now we, we have gathered more than 2.1 million records of violations and, um, uh, uh, and, and as well as hourly air and water pollution uh, monitoring data and, um, and also the hourly emission data uh, from 50,000 uh, major emitters nationwide. So this database is now widely used uh, for supplier uh, oversight with dozens of major uh, active uh, major companies uh, 
brands, global and local brands, using the uh, not just tap in, into the raw data, but they use our blue eco chain system, uh, which means an automatic screening tool that can send push notification uh, the instant any new records occurred. So the application has motivated so far 16,000 companies to address uh, their violations or make disclosure. Many factories uh, uh, along the supply chain uh, reported carbon emission into the database uh, by using the, uh, the digital accounting platform that we developed, uh, uh, co-developed uh, with the agencies affiliated to the, to the ministry. And uh, to quantify and report both their best baseline emissions and reduction measures. Uh, we're also digitizing the whole target setting and cost-effective analysis um, uh, process. Uh, uh, we're, as a member of the Green uh, China Green Finance Commission, uh, we're developing a dynamic environmental credit assessment tool um, and uh, a group of, uh, of major banks, including some of the largest state-owned banks, tapped into the data. Uh, into the database. During the pandemic uh, uh, last year, uh, China Postal Bank of China has, um, uh, we have helped them to run through tens of thousands of small and medium sized companies who want to borrow money from them uh, to identify the, uh, the risks and uh, help to validate that through big data. And, um, uh, and, and we're very happy to see this from this year, uh, some of the banks started push those who want to borrow money to also uh, go through this process uh, to uh, use the digital platform to help uh, 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 to drive them uh, to, to do their own accounting and making disclosure. We're also tracking the performance of all listed companies. Uh, the point I want to make is that uh, all this uh, now the data information is, uh, is so much more available. China is the factory of the world, not just manufacturing for ourselves, but for the entire world. China is also a hotspot uh, for, for the investors, global investors. Um, before, you know, they, many can argue in China, I don't know who are polluting, who are not. But now, you know, there's all this data that can help you, you know, make your more sustainable decision. You know, we have been able to put 7 million of these companies on the digital map, all color coded according to their, to their environmental performances. And if the Chinese companies started using that, you know, I, I challenge the global investors and, uh, and brands who make their commitment in align with the Paris Agreement. I, uh, I hope that uh, they can also pay attention and together we can bring the whole global investment and sourcing practice. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. So um, information transparency is totally key. Uh, and the COP26 announcement of the formation of the uh, ISSB, which unifies a number of reporting frameworks, will, will do that. I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Chen and Eric, um, how do we make sure that the data actually drives investment to the right places? I mean, it's a multi-stage process. So how do we connect um, the data platform to investors and make sure that investors are actually putting their money where their mouth is? Any clues on, on what, what we should be doing? Yeah. Uh, maybe first take uh, uh, Dr. Chen and then we'll, we'll turn to the minister. Yeah, thank, thank you, Pamela. Um, let me um, uh, go back to the uh, uh, your earlier question about market versus uh, non-market uh, actions. I, I know that uh, when, when, when uh, people are uh, including uh, climate experts uh, pay attention, uh, watch China just by reading the headlines. It's very easy to be uh, bought by uh, the big brush actions, uh, the drastic actions uh, from the top. But the, the, there is a much bigger, um, more fundamentally flawed uh, government uh, uh, action uh, or set of actions uh, that have been responsible for a lot of the uh, high um, energy exhaustion or high energy usage in China. So without sounding too abstract, let me, let me give um, a, 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 a few examples then we can see uh, what I really mean, okay. So 
for example, earlier I mentioned about uh, the uh, administratively uh, reduced electricity price. Uh, but even beyond that, of course, first I, I should uh, 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 make everyone remember uh, Econ 101. That is, if you want to reduce demand for something, the best thing to do is to let the price go higher, right? We all understand that. Well, if you want to increase demand for something, you cut the price. So it's as simple as that. But when it comes to government actions, uh, they always ignore that. Like, for example, uh, uh, local governments and central government in China for the last uh, number of years uh, lifted uh, all the highway toll fees for national holidays. In particular, they made the national day holiday seven days long. So the idea is to encourage people to drive and, and, and travel as far as they can. Well, here is the problem, okay. If you especially make the travel costs on the busy holidays lower rather than higher, then you, you're gonna introduce or encourage a lot of unnecessary driving and uh, you know carbon emissions. So if you are really serious about cutting emissions, then to, in particular during those busy national holidays, you should not only collect toll fees, you should make the gasoline prices and toll uh, fees higher rather than lower, right? So that's a way to balance uh, demand and supply for carbon uh, emission. So this is why, you know, well, you know, we can cut and shut down many coal mines. Wow, that's great. But if we don't do those uh, little things, but more effective things, when it comes down to the day-to-day -day dollars and cents calculations for consumers, households, then you have to work so much harder using administrative uh, uh, actions that will cause so many other distortions. So that's one example, right? And then a second example is uh, this observation I've been making for many years. Whenever I travel to uh, Beijing and other Northern uh, uh, cities in China during the winter time, I, uh, for many years, I was always amazed. Everyone uh, in his or her office in Beijing during the winter time, would have the windows open because the heat supply, the heat supply was so much, you, you just almost feel like you are gonna die, you know, if, unless you would open the window. Well, then you wonder why uh, Beijing would supply so much heat during the winter time? Why can't they use uh, uh, controller, controlling devices so that if the room is too hot, then you reduce the heat uh, 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 output, right? Well, then you have a problem because the heat producing factories are all owned by the government. And the government re uh, uh, regulates the prices to make the heat so, uh, 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 charges very low. And then if the factory decides, well, okay, during this winter, every day we are going to produce X amount of uh, uh, heat supply each day, you have to take whatever we give you. You have no choice except we just open the windows, let the heat go out. So more coal would have to be burned. Well, because the coal price has been reduced by government efforts so that heat supply for the whole city of Beijing can be very cheap so that people can just, uh, just totally uh, open the windows, let the heat go out. So I, I, I think this kind of uh, government imposed actions have produced the first order contributions uh, to environmental damage and uh, unnecessary energy consumption and uh, resource exhaustion. So whereas I know many uh, well-intentioned uh, environmentalists and uh, climate experts, they work so hard on those third order, fourth order improvements. Uh, without actually uh, really getting to the heart of the problem. Uh, the heart of the problem is the, the, 
you know, the, those government actions that have contributed uh, to much of the uh, uh, unnecessary uh, exhaustion and energy consumption. Of course, just lastly, uh, given the recent uh, crackdown on private, uh, on the private sector and many other things uh, uh, in China, you know, this is uh, going to make uh, the earlier consumption-driven uh, growth uh, model no longer uh, talked about, but also is forcing China actually, without people knowing it, to go back to the old manufacturing-driven, investment-driven economic growth model, which will mean, uh, again, uh, more energy uh, consumption. So I, I think they, they, we, we, we cannot just look at emission output and uh, environmental or sustainability targets just by uh, only looking at uh, this uh, metric or a few of the uh, environmental metrics without uh, paying attention to the whole general equilibrium in which in particular in countries like China, the government plays such a big role in deciding okay. how much energy consumption is actually uh, uh, required uh, or used in the country. So increase the prices, make people feel, feel a little bit more pain when they generate emission and uh, use more energy. So that's like uh, the, probably the, the easiest way or, or one of the most important ways uh, to, to reduce uh, 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 carbon emissions. Okay, thank you, uh, Zhu Wu. Um, Eric, um, Europe has uh, used um, administrative policies uh, on companies. Um, are you seeing the European markets moving more in favor of sustainability? And what can the rest of the world uh, learn from the European experience? Because you know, Europe is always uh, in the forefront. I mean, me as an Asian, I always think, oh, Europe, you're doing the right thing. You know, circular economy directive, plastics directive, very clear target setting. What are you seeing in Europe and what do you think should be adopted by the world? There is, <clears throat> there is a very positive development in, in Europe at the moment. <clears throat> and that's because uh, the European Union see environment not just as one specific separate issue, but as the way to integrate Europe and to make Europe competitive uh, for the future. The taxonomy will make it much, much cheaper for every company to get loans and financial support for going green and much more difficult if they want to go in the wrong direction. And the European carbon market is now, after some time, the price was very low, price is increasing, and it, have, uh, it has definitely an impact on, on, on policies all, all over Europe. So uh, I think Europe is definitely at the right track. Uh, speed needs to, uh, to be higher, uh, but the, the direction is, is very, very clear. And I think, <clears throat> sorry, we, we don't really need to wonder what, how we should handle these problems because the recipe is very old. This is how we handle, say, the hole in the ozone layer 30, 40 years back. Uh, that problem is resolved. Ozone layer is no, no any longer a threat to us because it, it came back in the same uh, shape as it was before we started uh, destroying it. And that is governments need to regulate markets as they now do in Europe. And we need to, as Professor Shannon and others, unleash the forces of the market with all the ability to take change to scale uh, and to innovate. And take as an example, the <clears throat> President Xi's promise that China will stop all overseas coal investment. It will have enormous impact on all markets in every developing country. Indonesia, Vietnam, Pakistan, Kenya, Ethiopia, they will all know now they can get no coal from China, but they know that as well as China can provide coal, it can provide solar, green hydrogen, electric mobility, wind power. So they will all of course start asking, uh, requesting China to provide all these. And then the enormous uh, machinery of the Chinese uh, economy will be put behind all these green developments. I think we, we cannot exaggerate the importance of this. And of course it will make Belt and Road a major scheme for taking the world in a green direction. And if I may add at the end, many companies are now far ahead of governments when it comes to going, <coughs> going green. They're not hiding behind governments. Microsoft is much greener than the United States of America. They have made amazing commitments. In Sweden, 
IKEA is now the world, uh, the world leader taking the world into a circular economy. They've done much more than any government anywhere in the world. And if I may add, I had the privilege to work with Anderson Tanoto and the April Group in setting up the April 2030 strategy. That's an amazing uh, example of an Asian company going far beyond what they're forced to by the Indonesian or any other government, but because they believe they believe to be, they want to be good citizens, but they also believe this is good for business. This is great future business for April to move into a more circular economy for the products and to protect the beautiful rainforest of Indonesia, which is of course the source of a lot of the income uh, of, the, of the April group historically. And the areas conserved by April is much better conserved than those areas conserved by the Indonesian government, because they, uh, April have all the resources to do it, the helicopters, the staff, the fire brigade, etc. And now we have seen last year, Indonesian deforestation is the lowest ever in the history of Indonesia. It's gone under the radar of the world. That is an amazing, amazing development, thanks to good government policies of the Yukovi government, and thanks to companies like April, but also others moving into be, becoming good green citizens and believing that the future of the world is green and that they need to take their part of that commitment. Hey, um, Anderson, anything to add? Um, I mean, you mentioned voluntary carbon markets uh, and, uh, you know, certainly that would be a big step forward. Are you finding um, much resonance amongst investors for your moves on uh, 2030 and the development of, you know, a forestry program? You know, what's fascinating is uh, while there are so many sustainability commitments from some of the Western companies, in some sense, Southeast Asian companies like us, we're still a few steps back. And uh, I think, Eric, you mentioned a little bit about, about April 2030, but I always share, uh, as a very young business leader in a relatively uh, large organization, I always share that I'm, I'm actually the most concerned about the environment, because if there's climate change and there are issues with the environment, I'll bear the brunt of it in the next 40, 50 years. So uh, I look at it from a very medium to long-term perspective. What it takes as a company that we need to do the right things so that the environment and the world we live in, and I live in the next 40, 50 years, uh, is actually livable. Uh, and from that perspective, I think a lot of Asian companies uh, can be much more ambitious. Um, and I think a lot of family businesses, specifically in Asia, are relatively conservative. Conservative because if they do not know how to get there yet, uh, they are not going to test the boundaries. Uh, from our perspective, we've always uh, pushed ourselves to go above and beyond. Uh, six years ago, uh, we were the first company to commit something called the Production Protection Compact. So one for one, so every hectare of plantation we operate in, we're gonna have one hectare of conservation and restoration project. And uh, right now we have over 400,000 hectares of conservation and restoration environment. Uh, just to give you some perspective, that is about seven times the size of Singapore where I normally live in. So it is a very large area. And in the worst uh, El Nino season, 2015, 2016, not one single hectare was actually impacted by forest fires, which was much more severe the rest of Indonesia. So there are models of, of private sector really taking a more uh, a stewardship mindset where we can go above and beyond what is needed from the regulation side. Uh, on the specific issue on voluntary carbon market, I think it's fascinating because as I shared, in Indonesia, it's always very challenging to put a dollar value on a standing forest. Um, and this is something that uh, we've always discussed extensively in the international world is that how can you give the right incentive mechanism so that people keep the forest standing instead of having it logged or burnt. And the voluntary carbon market allows you to do so. Uh, and and, and this, this, this to me is, is groundbreaking. And I think there are, there, are, uh, there are things that are happening as we speak uh, that the voluntary carbon market will definitely take off. For example, in Indonesia, uh, the carbon market right now is seven to eight dollars when it's without without uh, without adjustment, without corresponding adjustments. With corresponding adjustments, it's twenty to thirty dollars. And in Europe, if I'm not wrong, Eric, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's over sixty to seventy dollars the carbon market. So uh, with with that kind of pricing, there is a value for standing forest, and uh, there is definitely an opportunity for us to continue to support that market and continue to allow it to be traded globally. I would also um, add that there is a, a high amount of interest from the financial sector at the development of a voluntary carbon market, um, because this is actually a new asset class 
that can be traded, packaged, you know, de derived, and so on. And so, um, you know, in the big kind of push on sustainable finance, there is um, there is a lot of work to be done on the voluntary carbon market, and 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 I do know that uh, jurisdictions are running after this because it is um, it is totally a new market, and it it's 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 actually quite exciting. Um, I think if Asia can develop that and really make it a regional, um, if not global, affair, then actually we will begin to attract the amounts of investment that. Um, you all referred to. I'd just like yeah. to remind the audience um, that you are able to uh, post questions to the panel um, in the chat uh, or in the Q and A box. Um, Eric, did you want to? Were, were you were you going to add something? Okay, okay. Let's um, let's go on to the third topic that we need to address, which is the real elephant in the room. We've talked about pricing. We've talked about administrative policy and market mechanisms. The real question we have is that, you know, there, there's, you know, brands and retailers all, you know, marvel at the future of Asia's rising middle class. There's 2 billion more people who are going to become middle class consumers by 2030, 2040. Okay. And the, 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 the bulk of, you know, the global middle class is going to be in Asia. How do we enable them to live sustainable lifestyles and have sustainable consumption habits, knowing that private consumption drives 70 to 80 percent of global emissions? Okay, so how do we enable Asia to get rich, live well, but without blowing a hole through the planet? Um, anyone want to take a stab at this, and it really brings together all of what we've been talking about in terms of price signals, market signals, um, policy, and so on. Who would like to start? I'm happy to start, uh, Amala. Yeah, um, I think in China, you know, the um, obviously there's a um, carbon pick and neutrality pledge uh, needs uh, a total transformation of our social economic development model. Among them, of course, at this moment, the focus is, is a lot more on the, on, on the transformation of the energy supply side and uh, the, uh, the, re, the infrastructure, you know, the, uh, re, uh, the change the industrial structure and also the model of transformation and, uh, and heating and all of this. Uh, but, uh, uh, but the transformation of uh, of the lifestyle, you know, of uh, of green lifestyle is uh, is also important, and uh, this is uh, a priority listed by the central government, um, at least in the in the document. And the Ministry of Environment also paid great attention. I'm sure um, uh, Eric knows uh, very well about that uh, as uh, vice chair of CCICET. Uh, but it is also a more challenging one because it requires behavior change. Uh, this is globally very challenging. Um, the reason that, uh, that we, as I said, that we assess the performance of hundreds of brands of their environmental and climate performance is because we hope it can help facilitate uh, green consumption, helping our, our people uh, to make their own green choice. And um, uh, we're very happy to see some of the major uh, e-commerce platform like Ant Group uh, have decided to give lower interest loans to those brands which uh, uh, actually excel in, in our uh, in in our index assessment. Um, and to further tap into this consumer power, we're also developing a digital platform uh, to allow consumers to handily measure the carbon footprints of various products they consume day in and day out. Um, and uh, I think lot, uh, this is going to trigger a lot more action, uh, hopefully, uh, motivate them. And, um, and in the meantime, China, Chinese top leadership have also weighed in on the, uh, on, on the, on the garbage issue, you know, to uh, require the country to set up a garbage sorting program. Now, you know, hundreds of cities uh, uh, will be required to do that uh, by 2025. Um, I hope that the major beverage and the home care uh, uh, companies uh, can pay attention and the e-commerce companies can pay attention because you know, you know in some areas, uh, like in the Yangtze River Delta, the system had 
a model, uh, a system based on the model of Japan uh, and, um, uh, and, and Korea have, have been built. So there's a way to, uh, to fully recycle the, all the plastics. I think this is going to help with the clim on the climate side, and it also can help on the, uh, on, on the ocean plastic side. And last point I want to make is uh, in China, you know, we're also trying to uh, go back to, you know, Beijing, uh, trying to transform itself back into this capital of the uh, of bicycles. Uh, the mayor have uh, himself have uh, have ridden, uh, have been trying on the on the bike bike tracks uh, trips and try to promote the pri uh, for priorities to be given to bikers and uh, and all of this I think will be quite helpful. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ma. You've named all of the uh, key aspects like infrastructure, energy, industrial structure, and lifestyle. Um, I'm really conscious tomorrow is Singles Day. Is Singles Day compatible with sustainable development? Yeah, Singles Day. You know, this, uh, this e-commerce uh, has been so, uh, so much booming. You know, uh, in China, we have seen it boosted uh, the all this consumption in China. But on the other hand, uh, all this, uh, um, you know, there are upside, but there are also downsides, how to manage that, you know, with all the, uh, all the plastics and the packaging and um, uh, incredible uh, uh, glue ribbon, you know, all this are just in a, in, in a mind boggling uh, volume and uh, which gonna have such a big impact. And uh, um, so that's the reason uh, for, for China to pay so much attention on the municipal garbage sorting program uh, because we have to uh, make sure that people are going to take their responsibility uh, if they want to uh, have, you know, uh, have this kind of a lifestyle online. Thank you. Yeah, and this has actually um, come in as a question online. Um, you've talked about making green solutions attractive for business. How do we make green, green living attractive to consumers? A way to live better, not some bitter medicine they need to swallow. Um, and so it's really about, can we actually consume in a sustainable way? Um, Eric, you were, uh, you were going to speak next. Yeah, this I believe is the most critical question. And I, we, we need to ju just change our way of thinking. The old thinking came from the industrial revolution. It was first, basically you pollute like hell and when you become rich, uh, you start taking care of the environment. That was happened in Europe, in America, then later in Japan and Korea, and finally in China in the last, uh, last decade. But that's the old model. That's the model of the 19th or 20th century. The 21st century is the win-win model. And the reason why the win-win policy is possible is the main fact that the price of solar energy is now 10 percent what it was just a decade back wind power is also much much cheaper so we have the opportunity to develop very fast to provide all the products for singles day of course single day today is not sustainable everyone knows but single day the single day in 10 or 20 years into the future may be sustainable because we move into an economy based on renewables, those are the cheapest. By the way, um, uh, uh, solar energy in India today is the cheapest energy which has ever existed on planet Earth. Yes, true, there are issues and you need to prepare the grid, you need uh, batteries, I mean, there are issues, but basically we can move into renewable energy. We can move into electric mobility. Think of the fact that last week, Tesla was, had a higher market value than the nine next uh, companies co combined. When you add Toyota, Volkswagen, General Motors, all of them, still Tesla had a higher value than, than the rest. Why? Because everyone knows that the future is electric. Uh, last week, NIO, the Chinese uh, electric vehicle company, opened their shop at the main street of Oslo. Well, they will say they will sell no combustible engines. They just go into uh, electricity. Volkswagen just said that they wouldn't spend one calorie any longer on the combustible engine. We go all out electric. And if you move into agriculture in the southern Indian state of Andhra Pradesh, they have now demonstrated to the world that they can increase the yields by more environment-friendly ways of doing agriculture. 
Rwanda maybe a front runner using green tourism as a way to develop their land, protecting the gorillas in a fantastic way. But through that, bring tourists you can pay for for the development and protection. And as I mentioned, IKEA is for sure a global front runner. You will very soon move into an economy where you buy the furniture from IKEA. But if you want to shift from a green sofa into a red sofa, well, you can hand in your old sofa. They will take care of it, try to sell it to someone else. If they can't do that, they will make sure that it is recycled and all the components are reused. So I'm very optimistic, but the main thing, main issue is to change the thinking. Let's move away from this old win-lose thinking. That either you develop or you take care of the environment into the win-win propositions, which we now have in every single area. Uh, we can go green, uh, we can take care of Mother Earth, but by the same, we will improve our health and we will create jobs and prosperity. By the way, there are five times more jobs in America in the solar industry than in coal. Still, President Trump did a run around the world speaking as the jobs were in coal. How can we be fooled like that? Okay, thank you, um, Eric. <coughs> uh, maybe turn to Anderson. You know, you, um, Eric talked about putting circular into your business model. And actually it is a new business model that you're going to be developing. What, what do you see? You know, what does RGE look like in 15, 20 years? Or hopefully sooner, maybe, maybe sooner, but- um, It has, you know, has what, to be what, sooner than that. <laughs> um, no, but, but it's fascinating because uh, uh, I'll give it, a, let's start with the right raw materials. If you start with the right raw materials, it's much easier to make it biodegradable it's much easier to make it circular. So you, for example, to make coal sustainable by turning coal to gas, uh, or, you know, there was a movement towards that direction a, a few years ago. It, it's challenging because to make a, 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 a material that is in the first place not sustainable, to be sustainable, it's much harder to make things that are better. So start with the right raw materials. We try to do that, of course, with a lot of our products, that's first. Second, the right manufacturing process. Actually, uh, I had the privilege as well to interact with IPE, our organization, uh, one of our Visco Cellulose organization, Satri, actually worked with IPE. And one of our companies were actually uh, displayed in IPE's dash dashboard to improve our environmental standards. And we took it very seriously because it was very open, very transparent. We engaged with IPE, we improved. And IPE allowed us to actually come up with a roadmap and improve our manufacturing process. So right raw material and the right manufacturing process. Um, for example, Pamela, just to share, what does right manufacturing process mean? Back in the days when you have water effluent, typically in China, you're allowed to actually release water effluent, maybe uh, 10 to 20% of your water you use, uh, you're actually releasing it back, even though it's treated after that. But now, because water, water price is getting higher and higher, it's actually much more efficient to use technology to do water recovery system, to actually have 99.5% water recovery. So you use less water, you're using wastewater to actually use for industrial use. Um, 20 years ago, it will cost you 10 times the price. At this point of time, it's economically lower to recycle your water consumption than to buy fresh water. Um, so this is an element of market mechanism. It's an element of technology development and it makes good business sense. So I agree with Eric. You cannot say what's good for the environment is bad for business. It has to be what's good for the environment also has to be good for, for the business. And, and technology has allowed us to do that, both from the manufacturing side and the raw material side. And last but not least, the circularity. I'll share a perfect example. I think, Pamela, you know this as well in the textile industry. I come from the paper, paperboard, paper-based industry. Tissue, paperboard packaging in most developed countries is 80% recovery, 70 to 80% recovery. Textile, which is one of the products we use, viscocellulose, the textile recycling percentage globally is less than 1%. That means we, we make, produce, use textile, and we dispose, either in a landfill, because it's polyester based, or we incinerate. And that's the fundamental question. Is there an opportunity for us to actually recycle textile? And there are a lot of emerging technologies that's coming. So our company, ourselves, we put $200 million behind the newest technology possible to actually close the circularity, allow textile to be produced, used, and then actually recycled back. Uh, and not only downcycling, but upcycling. Um, so that's, that's the area where there's really real opportunities. We can recycle textile and it can, it can be made into a good business. So, so I think right raw materials, right manufacturing process with the right technology 
And last but not least, really allowing the consumers to enable the circularity to take place in the markets. Yeah, that's a um, great point, Anderson. I, I, I personally believe that there is a whole new business model in textile recuperation and recycling. We are just scratching the surface of that right now. Um, uh, and, 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 and that's a valuable resource. And we need to, like um, Mr. Ma said, we need to focus a lot more on uh, turning waste into valuable things and in recovery and waste pricing um, is part of that. Um, Jiru, anything to add here? Um, yeah, on, just, on, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to add very quickly uh, to this uh, question from uh, Mohammed uh, Cohen about green living uh, for consumers, right? I, I think the, uh, one of the things we tend to uh, forget while we talk about uh, the per consumer, uh, you know, use or uh, production of emissions, it's good to reduce the per consumer uh, emission level. But also we should not forget about the number of consumers uh, that can, also get out of control because now in China, there are incentives provided, uh, actually even administrative pressure uh, for people to have more children. I mean, it took so many years under the one child policy to finally stop, uh, you know, un, you know stop uh, limitless uh, population growth. So just as it is stabilizing at, uh, you know, 1.3 or 1.4 billion people. So now so many experts have uh, finally convinced the government, well, in order to have continuous economic growth, China needs to have uh, a larger population and continuous high population growth. Well, so the government listened. Uh, so a lot of incentives and orders are uh, given to uh, the people across the country to have a um, second, third, or, or, or even more children uh, per couple. So one day, if uh, Chinese population quickly gets to 2 billion people, then no matter how hard we work to keep the uh, per consumer uh, emission level uh, within some boundary, uh, some bound, then if the population grows even much faster, then we can you know, limit emission growth per person uh, on earth, uh, we cannot, uh, we can never win this uh, battle at all. So this is why, you know, I, I sometimes don't understand why many of the experts just totally just focus on population and economic growth, forgetting that uh, there are all kinds of costs with additional population growth. Uh, one of the big costs is uh, the damage to the to earth. Uh, I, I, it's simple math. Uh, if everyone uh, requires to uh, consume uh, this many uh, 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 units of energy, then the more population, then the more exhaustion of earth will have to be, uh, uh, yeah. Okay, anyway. so Drew, well, I'm gonna uh, push, push you a bit here. Okay. Um, so, do you think we need to um, stop going after economic growth or uh, simply re reconfigure what yeah. growth means, um, as in the previous session, is to integrate uh, more environmental considerations? So then, you know, we're not chasing just a number. That's what right. are we chasing? We're chasing yeah. prosperity. How do we define prosperity? I think more people in Asia should learn from uh, Scandinavians. Uh, from where Eric uh, is, uh, that is, you know, once uh, the material living standards have uh, reached a certain level, you know, why do we want to have more growth? Uh, you know, so what's the point, right? You only have 24 hours each day. Why don't we spend uh, some time enjoying life in other, in other non-material ways? So maybe uh, Buddhism uh, will help to some extent. Uh, to um, achieve more uh, uh, important goals in terms of uh, green living. Uh, I, I thought uh, if you're a, a Buddhist, then uh, you for sure uh, automatically pursue a, a very green living lifestyle. Um, anyway, so, so there are multiple things uh, 
uh, experts and uh, activists can do to uh, achieve sustainable goals um, uh, rather than just uh, economic goals. Hey, um, Eric, you know, we all talk about Scandinavia as like paradise. So tell us, tell, tell, what is the next stage? What's the next step for Scandinavia and Western Europe on sustainability? You know, because you've already reached such a, such a good living standard. Like how do we, how do we uh, move in the direction that Drew is, is, is talking about? But, uh, let's be fair. I mean, Scandinavia has true reached a high living standard and in many areas now have good environment policies. Uh, but Scandinavian emissions are much, much higher than Chinese emission, not to speak about Indonesian or Indian emissions per capita. Uh, so we have reached this level by the old model. Uh, the new model is not this. The new model cannot be this. The new model is how to have economic prosperity and growth, while at the same time doing it through a circular economy, as uh, Anderson very clearly set out, or how to do it by, by renewable energies and all, all the te available technologies. Uh, the historical emissions of the United States of America is 10 times uh, the Chinese emissions per capita and 20, 30 times Indian or Indonesian emissions per capita. Uh, so we need to move into a, a global economy where we prioritize development for those who need it. And I'm not so worried that the Chinese population will grow. I think to the country, China will struggle to keep up its population. And in Japan, as we know, its population is now rapidly declining. Uh, last year was the first year where South Korea had a decline. There were more people dying in South Korea than those born, born in South Korea. Uh, and even with the best intentions of President Xi and other leaders to, in, uh, to increase the Chinese population, it will be very, very hard because the, the young Chinese are so busy working and in so many other areas that they simply don't have time for sex or whatever reason there might be that <clears throat> that is hard to hard to uh, increase the population. However, Africa, we will see a doubling of the population to 2050 and a four doubling in the, this century. And that, of course, is the least uh, affluent con continent. It's the one nearly every single least development country is in Africa. There are Haiti in the Americas or maybe Nepal and, uh, and uh, well, I don't know exactly what else in Asia, but hardly anything else in Asia. No. Uh, okay. And we, so we, we need to focus growth, of course, on those uh, poor people who need to be brought out of uh, poverty and the large global lower middle class who still uh, should desire for uh, a lot of, of, of better living. But we have, the, we have all the policies, we have all the win-win policies. So let's not despair, but really change our thinking into how okay. can business take the lead and how can government uh, employ um, the win-win policies. Okay, thank you, um, um, Anderson, Eric, uh, Jirwu, and, um, and Ma Jun. We actually are out of time. I would just like to remind everyone that we have covered an incredible amount of, um, of territory. Uh, we know that the future of Asia is um, has is fueled by renewable energy, filled with smart infrastructure, has sustainable business and sustainable industrial industries, and where consumers can live um, very prosperous lives uh, in a very sustainable manner. And you know, we we need a lot of collaboration, a lot of action from all parties. We need the right markets um, and. Uh, we won't get there overnight, but uh, I think that with the momentum created by COP and with all the commitments of China, Japan, and Korea, we are, and Indonesia, uh, we are actually um, well on the way. So let's uh, keep up the good work um, and move a bit faster. So thank you all for your contributions on this panel.